Me up at night is Iran and the nukes. Um, now, to me, it seems like it's a fait accompli that we're going to have nukes in Iran soon enough unless something is done to stop them. Ben, what do you think is going to happen vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Israel going to do something about the nukes? Is it going to let it just kind of sit? Or is there some sort of great gamesmanship going on that we don't know about? I, I think Israel will let it sit. I don't think that, that Israel, I think they blew their opportunity waiting for Mitt Romney to be elected. Um, and I think that after Obama was reelected, they, Netanyahu realized he was boxed in, which is why you saw kind of the desperation play of, I'm going to do a full-throated PR campaign against the Iran deal, which was already well in effect and, and moving into effect before the election. Uh, it's, yeah, as far as what keeps me up at night, that it, it keeps me up at night for, you know, the family that I, my wife's family has in Israel and all the Jews in Israel and all the innocent people, Jewish and not Jewish in Israel, that keeps me up at night. As far as Iran nuking us, that doesn't keep me up at night so much as, as the, the dominance of the left in this country, which I feel, uh, the, the, the most powerful empires in world history don't fall because they're attacked from the outside. They fall because they've destroyed themselves from the inside. And so that, that's what really disturbs me. But in terms of, you know, the possibility of Iranian nuke, right now, is, uh, Iran will develop a nuke when Iran feels like developing a nuke. It's actually pointless for them to develop a nuke right now. Why do they need to? Right? Obama just opened up their economy, so they've got $150 billion a year flowing into their economy now, which is basically a quarter of their economy. And that means, and, and there are no restrictions at all in the Iran deal on what they can do with the money. Obama freely admitted that they can take that money and funnel it to terrorist groups as much as they want. That endangers Israel more than the Iranian nuke at this point. And, and what you're seeing is, is Obama purposefully, he did this, he purposefully created an Iranian sphere of influence. He, he did it actually as a counterbalance to Egypt and Israel, which had created a de facto alliance. Obama believes in balance of power in that region, and he believes that Iran is a stabilizing force in the region, because at least it's not a terror group. You know, he doesn't care that they sponsor terrorist groups all over the place. But Obama, it's long been an agenda of his to quote unquote moderate the Iranian regime. And so he basically just handed over Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and Yemen and probably parts of Afghanistan to Iran. Uh, and he, he did it knowing full well what he was doing. Israel's gonna face a serious battle now because Hezbollah is gonna be armed up in, in the north and Hamas is gonna be armed up in the south. And so what we're gonna see is a series of kind of small wars until the time 10 years from now when Iran says, we've done everything we can do with money, now we need a nuke. Regarding uh, uh, Iran and the nuke, I guess people were asleep when uh, James Clapper, who is our national intelligence director, was on with uh, Charlie Rose on, on CBS. They were on the NPR show. He's got two shows. He's got a show on CBS. He has a show on NPR. And James Clapper said, well, as far as I'm concerned, Iran already has the ability to have a nuke, the capacity, the talent, the know-how. They just have not made the political decision to weaponize. And Charlie Rose went, what? And he repeated it. Now, this is our national intelligence director. In other words, they already have the ability to build a nuke. And no one said a word. Tree fell in the forest, no mm -hmm. sound. Regarding this Iran deal, uh, Robert Gates was his secretary of defense. He's on CBS talking to Bob Schieffer. And Bob Schieffer says, why is, why is uh, Obama doing this Iran deal? And he says, Obama is doing this with the hope, his word, that within 10 years of economic prosperity, Iran will be dissuaded from their terror activities and become a member of the international community peacefully. He said, I think this hope is unrealistic, but this is what Obama believes. This is his former national, uh, former uh, defense secretary saying that basically President Obama is naive in doing this deal. And again, no one said a word. Well, because, because My goodness. Obama's a Marxist. I mean, he really is in terms of his, his fundamental thought. And so on an international level, if you ever read the, everything that you need to know about Barack Obama is in the introduction to the 2001 edition of Dreams from My Father. Right? He talks specifically about what his view of the world is. And in that, he specifically says that he knows the despair that has, that has been cast upon people from Jakarta to the south side of Chicago. And it can't be fixed. Through, for, through escalating use of force of arms. That's his entire foreign policy. And this is why when, when Jen Psaki at the State Department said to fix ISIS, they just need jobs, and everybody laughed, so that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. He actually thinks that. He actually thinks that the reason that Iran is so pissed at everybody is because they're economically bereft. And, the, and therefore, if we just open them up economically and we redistribute the way, right? If you spread the wealth around, everybody is better off. And so if we, if we spread the wealth around in Iran, then magically the moderates will rise. Of course, this neglects pretty much all of world history. But, it, but, it's, but it's, a, it's a wonderful vision. The Dreams from My Father was an extraordinary book. Uh, obviously, he wrote it, in my opinion, not thinking he was going to become president of the United States. This idea that Obama got elected because he's black, he's going to bridge, uh, bridge the divide, the racial divide, I am confident a lot of people voted for him for that reason. If you read his book, you wouldn't have. Exactly. 
Uh, there's, a, there's a scene in his book where he uh, meets Reverend Jeremiah Wright for the first time. Obama was looking around trying to determine which church he was going to belong to. So he hears about this church that's politically connected, which to me is the primary reason he voted. He, he went with that church. He arrives at the church early, and uh, Wright's not there yet. So he starts talking with a black secretary of Jeremiah Wright. And she's been working for Wright for years. And she's a single mom raising a kid in the inner city by herself. And she tells Barack Obama that she's thinking about moving to the suburb because her kid wants to be in the marching band. And his high school does not have a marching band. And the high school in the suburbs that they looked at not only has a marching band, but they have free uniforms. So she's thinking about relocating there. And she told Obama that Jeremiah Wright is trying to talk her out of it. And Obama said, why? And she said, well, because Jeremiah Wright believes as a black kid, if he moves to a predominantly white suburb, he will lose his identity. Now, he's telling this to a biracial kid whose mother is white. Uh, when he lived in Indonesia, when he was 10 years old, his mother sends him to Hawaii so he can get a better education. He ended up going to Punahou, the finest prep school in Hawaii, the rest you know. So she's telling this to Obama. So Jeremiah Wright comes. I'm, I'm reading the book, and I'm waiting for him to, to say, I jumped on, 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 on Wright. I excoriated Wright for, for being bigoted, for being racist, for not wanting uh, his, uh, this woman's son to have the best education the way my mom wanted me to have the best education. So he asked him, about this, and Jeremiah Wright says, that's right, that boy won't know who he is. That's it. Obama joined the church. That tells you everything you need to know. Yeah. I was flabbergasted. It's, um, I, I want to move a little bit, because you mentioned it briefly, Ben, uh, about ISIS, also another very important hot topic. Um, ISIS, as I think we all three agree, uh, is the product, at least the growth of, of ISIS, is the product of our leaving Iraq uh, without a single man left. Um, and now we have this crisis on our hands, and it seems to be unraveling. And then, of course, Syria is affected uh, and otherwise. The Russians are now coming in. Well, how do you see this playing out, Larry, uh, when, it, when Russia is now uh, going in there? Are they going to just try to conquer the entire territory or, or what? Um, I, I don't know how it's going to play out. But, but let me just comment first on the, on the first part. Um, this assumption that uh, ISIS would not be the force that, that it is had we left a stay-behind force. It's not just right-wing stuff. Uh, Ray Odierno, the outgoing uh, uh, army uh, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that in his goodbye interview. He said that had we left a stay-behind force, we feel that ISIS, ISIS would not have developed to, the, to be the force that they were. So it's not just us saying this, it's the military saying this. Regarding what's going to happen right now in the future, I have no blooming idea. We had an opportunity, in my opinion, to impose a no-flight zone. If we do it right now, essentially we're declaring war against Russia, because Russia is flying right now. Interesting. Uh, do I believe that Donald Trump is right when he says, well, uh, ISIS is bad, uh, Assad is bad, let them all fight? That assumes that they're not trying to come to us. That assumes they're not trying to hit us. And so we have to somehow try to influence the outcome. But as to, it, to do it right now, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, ben, what about you? Well, I mean, I think that the, it's, it's easy to do hindsight, and, and it's, it's hard to do foresight, obviously. Uh, in, in hindsight, obviously, nobody should have pulled the troops out. It was idiotic. The, the number of troops, people don't know this, the number of, how many ISIS fighters actually went into Iraq originally? Anybody know the answer to this? How many ISIS fighters originally crossed the border from Syria into Iraq? 5,000. It's 5,000 people, right, against an army of 121,000 in Iraq. And they proceeded to take over half the country. And that's because the, the army in Iraq was incredibly weak, right, and because as always, the left in the United States believes idiotically that, because, that, that if people are really, really into fighting for their country, they'll just do it. They said this about the South Vietnamese. If, when you pull out, they'll fight for themselves and it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. right? they, they, also, they, they, they said this over, they said this, by the way, in 1918 when the, when the Reds took over. There was the White Russians versus the Red Russians. And we actually had troops in Russia. And Britain sent troops to Russia also. This idea that the communists and, and the Americans never fought is not true historically. Right after World War I, there were actual U.S. troops who were killed in Russia. Uh, and, uh, and we pulled out because Woodrow Wilson said, well, if the, if the Red Russians want it, they'll take it. If the white Russians want it, they'll take it. Uh, and so the same thing sort of held true there. Obama, we pulled out, and Obama said, let, it, let, you know, let God sort them out, basically. They'll figure it out. Um, yeah, the, Vladimir Putin is not crazy. He's certainly not stupid. Vladimir Putin is a power politician down to his bones, and he is the most successful Russian leader since Stalin. What he is doing right now is unbelievably audacious, and he knows he's got a sucker in the White House, and he's going to continue pushing until there's no pushback. 
um, and, or until there is pushback, rather. And, and what he's done, this is a, it, you, have to, you have to see what, what Putin's doing as part of a chain, right? So first he starts off, and he tries to push Bush by invading Georgia. And so he takes over part of Georgia at the very end of Bush's tenure, and Bush push, pushes back a little bit, but not enough, and he ends up maintaining part of Georgia as now Russian territory. Then Obama comes into office, and Obama, after Bush was already weak on Russia, after Bush was already too weak on Russia, he comes into office, he says, we're going to reset. Sorry, he was too strong. We need to reset now. And so Putin looks around and says, okay, well, I'm not going to leave Medvedev in charge, right? I mean, now I've got my man. I'm, I'm coming back. And so he came back, and then he proceeded to invade Ukraine and under the same guys that Hitler used to invade Crimea Czechoslovakia. Yeah, right? He inv he, right, he invades Crimea, which is part of Ukraine. And he, mm -hmm. and he does so under the guise that Crimea has a bunch of ethnic Russians who are being uh, set upon by the locals, right. Right? which is exactly what Hitler said about Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so he has to invade there. And Obama does nothing as the entire country is overrun. And as Russia starts shipping in... Russian forces to Ukraine proper. By the way, Russia, I mean, understand, Vladimir Putin has shot down not one, but two civilian airliners while he's been, pres while, while he's been the, the current president of Russia, and the West has done nothing, right? He shot down that Malaysian flight recently, and then before that, he shot down the flight that had like half the Polish government on it, because he didn't like the Polish government, so he just shot it down, right? And nobody did anything. And so, and so now he looks in the Middle East, and he says, okay, Obama clearly wants out of here, and Obama made that clear when he drew his red line in Syria, and then he proceeded to hand over that entire deal to Putin. He said, Putin came in last minute and said, oh, Barack, I can handle this. And, and Obama said, sure, sounds great, it's all yours. And, and so and Putin walked right in the front door. So what's, what's going to happen next? Well, it, it's, a little too, it's too little too late to start establishing no-fly zones. Uh, you know, the Chinese, by the way, tried this with Bush, you remember, when they, when they knocked down a, 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 US, a U.S. Airplane, right? Well, they knocked down a military jet early on in Bush's tenure, and Bush told them to basically go screw themselves, and they had to return the jet and the pilot. You remember this? This is very early on mm -hmm. when there's a, the jets hit each other, which doesn't happen. And, uh, and, and so in, in Russia, you know, can in, in Syria, could we establish a no fly zone? No, because there's no credible threat. I mean, Putin knows we're not going to send troops into Syria to fight his guys. So Putin is smart. What he's doing is he's now eliminating the only opposition he has there. He's making this. It's, it's, you have to admire the brilliant evil of it. He's taking all the people who we funded, and then he's saying, okay, there are three forces. There's Assad, there's Free Syrian Army who we funded, and there's ISIS. We're just, ISIS is not fighting Assad, because ISIS doesn't care about Assad anymore. They just want their own territory in the north. They, they figure, we'll leave Assad alone, he'll leave us alone, it's all cool. Assad doesn't care about ISIS, because he realizes that territory is lost. So what Putin is doing is he's going to the people who threaten Assad, he's killing all of them while saying he's killing all the people in ISIS, right? He, he, he hasn't killed anybody in ISIS. Nobody in ISIS is dying. He's killing only people we fund. And Obama is sitting there twiddling his thumbs. Within the next month, basically, there will be no opposition to Assad. So there will only be two forces in Syria, at which point it's Assad and ISIS. And then the United States has the choice. Do we side with Assad or do we side with ISIS? And the answer is we're going to do what we've always done. We're just going to say we don't side with either. Vladimir, take it away. Well, you're saying that Obama doesn't have a plan. He does have a plan. He wants to train the Syrian rebels. He spent a half a billion dollars. He's trained five. That's a million, hundred million dollars per rebel. As I was saying earlier, I remember Give when... Give me a hundred million dollars. I'll train, man. That's, that's I remember when the six million dollar man cost six million dollars. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's interesting. On, on that very issue, though, um, yeah, I remember the $500 million that they squandered away, and, and, and now they just recently gave up that program, mm -hmm. by the way. Yeah. All right, so related to all this, of course, is the... Uh, the Syrian immigration crisis. Now, it, I'm going to pose this question. Uh, do you feel that, that this is going to have a permanent effect, as I do, on Europe as it's moving over? And then secondly, uh, do you feel that, um, that this is really a genuine immigration crisis? In other words, is this really just a ploy by some ISIS fighters and otherwise who want to do some mischief in Europe? Will have a permanent effect on on uh, on Europe. I think it's about 14 million altogether uh, that we're talking over a period of time. Uh, I, I don't believe it is a genuine refugee crisis in the sense that uh, most of these people are coming from uh, countries other than Syria. At least half of them are coming from countries other than Syria. Uh, it is a direct intent on the part of uh, of uh, Islamic extremists to change Europe. Uh, and Europe uh, has no idea what to do. Uh, the ver various different countries are are fighting with each other about what to do. Germany is the one that's, that's driving the train, in part because of guilt over the Second World War, uh, but it's going to fundamentally alter the Middle East. These people ought to be staying in their own country or going to Saudi Arabia where there's plenty of space. Well, th this, is, this is the part that, that's, that's amazing, is that people should recognize, if there were a refugee crisis in Europe, how many people do you think would try to immigrate to Saudi Arabia? Less than zero, 
right? I mean, people would actually immigrate from Saudi Arabia into Europe during a refugee crisis. The, the, so, the, I mean, there, you've got 400 million people of Arabic descent in that area, and you've got 100 million people who are Shia, and that's most of the people from Syria are Shia, and, and nobody can find a place for these folks. I mean, the, the, you have to understand also that, that a lot of the people who are now immigrating into Europe are coming not from Syria direct, but they came from Syria, and then they were in Turkey. So you remember that photo, that terrible photo of the father carrying his three-year-old child who had drowned off the beach and all this? That was in Turkey, right? They were in Turkey for over two years before they tried to get into Europe, right? Before they tried to, and the reason they're trying to get into Europe is twofold. One is there are some people who are terrorists, and then the second is because living in Europe is a lot better than living in Turkey. Living in Europe is a lot better than living in Libya. It's a lot better than, I mean, it's, it, it's like, the question is sort of like asking, is the, is the refugee crisis from South and Central America genuine, or is it a bunch of criminals trying to cross the border? And the answer is that there are some criminals, some of it's genuine, but it will, no matter what the rationale, it's fundamentally going to alter the nature of Europe, no question about that. And the answer is, as to whether we should be taking these people in is absolutely not. Absolutely not. The idea that, that Europe is responsible somehow for taking in all the refugees of the world, or the United States is responsible with no background checks. For how do you background check anyone from Syria? You call Bashar Assad's government? and ask what Mohammed Mohammed's background is, it, it just, how does that work, practically speaking? It doesn't work. And so you know, what, what exactly do you do? The, the answer, and if you really feel bad, just sign a check to the Saudi government and tell them to take them in. But the problem, of course, is that the refugee problems in the Middle East are almost entirely because Arabs and Muslims refuse to take in other Arabs and Muslims. The reason Palestinians are still living in refugee camps 70 years after the founding of the State of Israel is because none of the other Arab and Muslim states would take them in. And they're literally living in refugee camps in southern Lebanon. Right, which is a Muslim state. They're still living in refugee camps in Jordan. Why are there refugee camps? Nobody ever answers this. The UN refugee program, the UNRWA, was specifically designed for the Palestinian refugees back in the 1950s, and it's still around now. Have you ever heard of such a thing? I mean, it's, it's, it, it demonstrates once again that for, for, for a lot of people in the world who, who tend to decry colonialism and imperialism as the greatest of all evils and we can never impose our values on others, well, they're forcing us to impose their values on them in the sense that they are coming to our countries where theoretically we have to impose our values on them, but then we refuse to do so. More money has been spent on these refugees per capita than was spent during the Marshall Plan. Mm. You mean the, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and still uh, more money be, has been spent on these refugees per capita than we spent during the Marshall Plan. You're talking about the Syrian refugees. Yeah, I'm talking about Palestinian, Palestinian refugees. Palestinian, yeah. mm -hmm. Palestinian refugees, by the way, I, I think that the reason why they're they're not incorporated into the other Arab countries is simply because they, they don't want them. They, they serve better as political pawns. Yeah. And then that, that's true of the Syrian refugees as well. Uh, all you have to know about the Syrian refugee crisis is the sex of the people who are now the refugees. Oh, if so you look in say, the Middle East, right now, that's right. 50% of all the refugees in the Middle East are, are male, 50% are female. 72% of all the refugees who are entering Europe are male. Okay, so what happened to that, that percentage? Well, what happened is all the women stayed behind in the Middle East while the men went ahead and immigrated, or all the young men who were single immigrated. But either way, it's not good for the, for the European states. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what, what I can't wrap my mind around is Angela Merkel, she knows that there's already an immigration crisis in Europe in her own country, and that uh, there's a lot of talk about Islamic uh, terrorism and Sharia law and such. Right. And, and she sees this crisis and says, let's bring in 800,000 more, which is going to be more likely a million at the end of the year, right? So, and and uh, it's asked the other countries in the European Union to accept their, quote, fair share. Right. Close quote. Well, I mean, there's a reason that some of the political leaders in Europe are accepting a lot of refugees, and that's because the refugees vote one way. I mean, 98% of, of Muslims in France voted for Francois Hollande in the last French election. You think he wants more refugees or less refugees? Yeah. Well, I mean, that wouldn't explain Angela Merkel, though. She's on a well, the, 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 she, well, she also is, is setting up... I mean, there, there's some German domestic politics at play as well here, but, but par, one of the things that happens is that there is a, a, a far-right threat in Germany that she is afraid of, and so she's trying to create Get more of, of a... Yeah. She's trying to create more of a gap between herself and, and, and a lot of those folks. Mm. Oh, very interesting. Uh, what about the immigration... Oh, okay. Uh, hook, hook. Are we, is it time now for the Q&A? All right, let's... let's uh,